I want to note that uh, did hosting for the Twitch Chats Choice Awards. I hope some of you saw that. I hope some of you saw that. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun, man. That, um, I got to say, it, it was a really meaningful event uh, for me to do. and uh, Because, you know, um, I was finding, I think I talked about this at the end of last year, that I was finding I had a lot of stress and a lot of just general pain that I didn't really know what to do with because I like working. I like my work. I like streaming. Believe it or not, I'm enjoying myself right now. You wouldn't even think it, huh? Because I look so haggard and beat up and devastated whenever I'm speaking. I like doing this. So I like doing the work. I like doing more and more and more and more and more of that sort of thing. But man, I was finding that when I was going to events, the stress was bubbling up and I was having huge spikes of anxiety and stuff. Again, for one of my favorite things to do. Hosting events and talking about games. I mean, I love, I love doing it. It's wonderful. Uh, and I was even finding it in, like, interpersonal relationships, right? I was even finding it like, hey, Sean, so how was your day? Tell me about it. I'd start to tell a friend about my day, but because I like to storyify things, I would tell a story, and here's what happened. And I'd, I'd start to tell a story. I'd again, get a huge spike of panic and anxiety, you know, and it was, it was rough. And I've been having sort of wavering levels of that uh, with regards to... Being in COVID, because it's stressful, you know, especially when I, I had um, two family members get very sick with COVID, very sick. Uh, and one family member get very sick that we thought she had COVID, but she turned out not to, so hooray. Um, yeah, a lot of those st sort of spikes, and, you know, I've been, I've been sort of off hosting for a while. I have not done a lot of hosting stuff, because there's been no such thing as events. And so when I did the Chats Choice Awards, I got it was just a really fun event, uh, and it felt really nice, felt really in my element. Um, you know, I did also a, a lot of smart techniques because I find that I find that there's always two ways to push on any problem. One is in the moment techniques. So, for instance, with with nervousness or anxiety or stress. <sighs> A breathing exercise that I can do right now to ease that. That's one thing. The second way to do it is change the circumstances. For instance, uh, what I started to do um, whenever I was feeling various amounts of stress is just exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Sleep nine hours a night. A shitload. So on and so on and so on. And so leading up to this event, I was just exercising a lot. You know, doing a lot of sleeping. And I just, ah, oh, that, just, the crew was great, and Mari Takahashi is just, she's just so much fun. Oh my god. Like, we were just laughing up a storm during rehearsals and stuff, and it just, it felt, it felt great. So I was really happy um, to feel comfortable in the, um, in the show. And, you know, it was a lot of fun, too, because, dude, fuck all these bullshit awards. You know, can I just say this? Like, on one hand... People work for years on their film or their game, and giving them an award is really nice. But at the same time, I am so aware of, as someone who has received awards for doing stuff, and I'm the same shitter I was before and after, <laughs> and I'm just sort of like, ah, oh, man, why are we hyping this up so much? But what I loved about the Chats Choice Awards is that it was just like, dude, it's just, it's just a fun event, and everyone's going to win. It's just a big celebration of all sorts of games. We even spent time talking about, you know, fifth place on there. So that was like a lot of fun. Oh, that was good stuff. So I'm feeling great. I'm feeling grand. Um, I have another event coming up next week, which is the Magic the Gathering Mythic Invitational. Whoa! And then, uh, let's name this. Historic, Historic Boros Clown Token. We're gonna do some historic today. Uh, I really want to learn the meta, but I also really want to mess around. So maybe next Tuesday, I'll be playing some more of the better meta decks, and on Wednesday, I'll be playing more of the better meta decks. But today, today we'll do a little bit of a mixture, and this is this is a list that uh, I'm really interested in. It's a Boros list that runs maybe my favorite card uh, that you have access to. In this set, show me what I don't own. Wait, is this is this standard? Did I mess this up? You're kidding me. There it is. All right, Creator Hoof Behemoth. We're not gonna put a single forest in here. 
This is a forestless crater hoof behemoth deck. When it enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain trampling at plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of creatures you control. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready for the rest of the deck? Alright, now how do we get out Crater Hoof Behemoth? Well, let me let me let me build I'm gonna build the the, the, the ends of it first. We're gonna get in for Legion Legion's Landing and for Satyr's Cunning. Which just looks like such a garbage card. Alright. You see you see how we have some little babies? You see how these generate tokens? You see how these generate tokens? Do you know the card? Transmogrify? Exile creature. That creature's controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a creature card. That player puts that card into the battlefield and shuffles the rest of their library. So if the only creature in my deck is Crater Hoof Behemoth, and everything else is tokens, for redundancy, we have a pair of Lucas. <laughs> Shout out to Jeff Hoagland. Thanks for the list idea. Uh, you know, we're going to have to raise the alarm. Some instant speed make a pair of tokens. Uh, what's the name of this other one? Uh, Dragon Fodder. Create two. One, one red goblin creature tokens. Yada, 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 yada. Oh, I'm so happy. Stepping into historic. I have so many wild cards to build. To just burn. This is great. And I think I also have like a ton of packs. Never mind, I'm not going to look at that yet. We're going to go ahead and take a peek at our forbidden friendship. When men... Love dinosaurs. They make dynamen. Alright. Oh, who could possibly forget the other greatest token generators of all time? Um, the history of Banalia. Uh, and Heroic Reinforcements. And I think I think we got it. I think we got it, right? This is it should be a 24 lander. Ten 10 2, yeah, great. Okay. This is it. This is this is the deck. Now, uh, I just want to note something about the curve. If you're more mid rangey, you want a little bit more smoothness to this because you'd say, oh my goodness, we have fewer three drops. But really, if you have lots of one drops and lots of two drops, then on turn three, you can do a little mixture of each of these. So, really, we're very straightforward. We're an aggro deck. Uh, sacred Foundry that is going to try to play Crater Hook Behemoth. Oh my god, you love to see Clifftop Retreats. You love to see a Clifftop Retreat. Oh! Uh, and Breath. We have a lot of tokens. We want to buff them, but pretty much the rest is going to be some planes in Spain that stay mainly in the plane. we got to get the good ones. Oh, that. I mean, that's gorgeous. Can I craft this? Oh man, that's real pretty. I really like that. I mean, I've been doing this lately... And I mean, th this is going to sound a little stupid, but, um, you know, I've never sounded stupid before. So let's try it on. See what it feels like as a first attempt. I, I, I remember when I was a student um, at Harvey Mudd, which again was in a, just a fucking hard, hard, hard school. But what I loved so much about Harvey Mudd is that it was not the teachers trying to be combative. It wasn't the teachers going, oh, you have to do the work. Ugh. And if you can't keep up, too bad. It was you plus the teachers as allies versus the work. They were so supportive, so wonderful, so great. And uh, there was this uh, professor there, Professor Jacobson, who actually said that uh, it was Professor Jacobson, Professor Burnoff, um, who talked about the value of making your work look pretty to you. Um, I remember Prof. Jacobson was talking about using colored pencils to highlight certain things to make your math homework beautiful and in that way it's less work that you need to get done and it's kind of something fun to just make look nice and you're, you're doing some work and then you're also making it look nice and you're doing some work and you're also making it look nice and I really started doing that a lot and Professor Burnoff is this math professor at uh, Harvey Mudd who is just legendary for beautiful board layouts just, I mean, and would use colored chalks to highlight things. And, oh, it was just gorgeous. It was incredible. And I um, I started doing that on all my homework. And, I mean, my grades shot up substantially. I struggled at, at the start of Harvey Mudd. But, I mean, I used to just get up on Saturday and immediately begin doing my math homework. It was just fun just to make it look pretty. Until, like, dude, by, like, 
junior or senior year, I mean, the people who graded the math homework would be like, Sean, thank you so much for always making your homework so pretty. And I was like, yeah. It literally takes no effort to do, right? It's just, or excuse me, it takes no complex thought to do. You just you just make make it pretty. And this is, this is kind of what I um, have started to make myself do more often. You know, just like find the pretty lands and make the deck just look a certain way. Look really nice. I mean, I think all of you know that I'm a huge fan of the Ravnica arts and stuff like that. And I like to think of it uh, as a style of as a style of self care. Style of self care feels very good. Sully. 2718, formerly known as T. Sully, I presume. <laughs> Sully has subscribed now for a streak of 113 months. It says, congrats on the engagement. Thanks, man. I fucking love that girl. All right, this hand looks good. Looks like we're gonna have that Rakdos style deck. Well, you know, one of the goals that I am obviously trying to do today as I'm playing Historic is I'm trying to learn more about what the big decks are. And, you know, I I, I have played some uh, Historic before, but uh, I'm gonna be extra cognizant. I don't wanna be able to flip the Legion's Landing, you know. There's, there's a few people I wanna I wanna specifically call to today. A few folks I wanna specifically call to. Uh, I believe average game guy I saw talking earlier about uh, a book that you worked on getting published. Oh, that's filthy combo. Dreadhorde Arcanist getting to recast from the grave. Oh, you're doing innocent blood. Okay. Do I like dinosaurs more or do I like humans more? I definitely like dinosaurs more. Average game guy, you have a publication that you're part of that got published? Is that is that one? Hey, thanks, Lonely Physician. Yeah, man. Getting married to Brit. Marrying the coffee angel. Is this thing still up? Ah, oh, it's we're good. Well, this is kind of a nice peel. I don't know how much longevity we can get with the Flip Legion's Landing in this particular matchup. I mean, we're, we're almost certainly going to get Thought Sows. You love to see it. Average Game says, yep, publication happens for I'm super hyped, man. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that sweet, sweet publication. Tell us about it. Tell us about it so that I thusly may direct people towards something that I know nothing about. It could be unicorn slash fiction. Um. What does Young Pyromancer even do whenever you cast an instant or sorcerer spell create a... Oh yeah, this card is just rad. Goodbye to you. Now, now, how how likely do you think it is that off the top we get a transmogrify, huh? Well, we appear to be in a bit of a pickly spot. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. We have about ten what I would consider finishy type cards. Heroic reinforcement is one of those, right? Because we can just get the whole team to swing for a billion. Um, but the bigger ones are Transmogrify and Luca. I read Gingo says it's Collective Darkness collaboration project from lots of local authors. I think, uh, by the way, I think that, like, um, oh, I'm not even paying attention. I'm getting a fucking ass kicked, man. 
I think I'm gonna still say no, because I believe in the crater hoof. I believe it's hoofing time. I believe that I have died. That'll do. Thanks, ghosty. Yeah, all my usual applications are not on because I had to reboot the compute. Oh my gosh, Dreadhorde Arkness flashing back village rights. That's cool, that's cool. I think I think that like uh, anthologies are just like such a fun way for people to just in, just enjoy writing and not have a lot of pressure on it, you know. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, sweetie. Hi. Sheriff. Why are you in the corner? Are you chewing on the modem cables, making our internet go down? No, you're being a good cat. Hey, sweetheart. Where are we going? That cat is fucking awesome, man. Alright, it's it's yours. Well that's well that's so dope. And we pig, uh, I, I recall also seeing when I first uh, hopped in that you are working on a project that you were feeling excited about. And I'd love to hear more upon that too. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> you looked insane. Hey, come here, sweetie. Let's get you some scritches. Yeah, yeah don't worry. It's dad. Yeah, hi. Hi. Hey. Hey, darling, come here. Come on back. Yeah. I think she wants to play. Who doesn't? All right. Damn it. All right, now we're fucked. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I think anthologies are just such a great... I mean, it, it, anthologies and published anthologies feel to me like the writer's equivalent of a game jam. You know, where it's just like, hey, it's the GMTK game jam, and this this topic is... the entire whole. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> And then you spend 48 hours making your game about the entire whole. Um, <laughs> I feel like we're going to see a lot of geese and a lot of Stitcher's suppliers today. Alright. Halfway there. But yeah, like with anthologies, like if you're writing a whole book and your book sucks, you know, if it starts good but then it gets bad, you're just like, oh. Oh, the, the whole book is ruined. I need to fix the whole book. But I mean, if you're doing an anthology, man, you like read a short story in there and you go, well, that one wasn't really my thing. And then you just keep reading. Go to a different one. It's great. Only physician says, how are you, Sean? Other than your engagement, it's been too long I've been able to join the stream. You know, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty, pretty, pretty freaking good. I, um... Got engaged. It's wonderful. Average game guy gifted 25 subs. Holy shit, average game guy. Damn. Romping and stomping in. For the hype, of course. Well now, well, now I'm obligated to let all of you know that average game guy's book is available for a dollar. Now, normally we would call this marketing, but, 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 
Average Game Guy, get this, this is this is how thoughtful Average Game Guy is. Average Game Guy was excited about the publication and wanted to talk about it, but didn't want to uh, do, frankly, what a lot of shitters do, where they just, like, step in and they're like, Hey, good to be part of the stream. Look at my stream. Good to be part of the stream. Read my book. You know, one of those sort of dudes? One of those sort of dudes? This is really bad news. Oh, Sheriff's having charge on The average game guy was just super thoughtful and great. Damn, we almost pulled it off. By the way, so this this is this is Jund Collected Company. Or Jund Coco for short. So you, you many of you may notice from standard the usual package of Jund being a gilded goose, mayhem devil, woe striders, lots of different tools to sacrifice. Wow, this is... We are not going to have a good time here. What, what can you do? It's the same sort of mix, but... First of all, you have Blood Artist, which is another way to say... Whenever Blood Artist or another creature dies, target player loses a life and gains a life. Even better, Pinger. Mayhem Devil, also a Pinger. So basically, Blood Artist can kind of function as redundancy for Mayhem Devil in some ways. Sack this and start pinging things. Uh, but yet, yeah, Average Game Guy was just really thoughtful about it. I was really excited about it, and I totally invited Average Game Guy to just share a little bit about it. So I'm happy to plug some of the stuff that y'all been working on. Isn't, isn't this deck cool? I mean, the, the thought process is relatively straightforward in the Jun Sacrifice deck. Get a bunch of small support creatures out, and then get things that trigger on Sacrifice, and just swing away. One, two, three, four, five, six. Baby, what is it? Share. What? Literally, what is it? Hi. Oh my god, it's so hard to be a little brown cat in this world, isn't it? I think I need to lead back the our hoofy friend. Hi. This guy's not. Hi. No, 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 no. Well, this is pretty bad. Okay. Well, this is actually really good. Did I win? <laughs> okay. Hello. All right, let's get sacrificing. Oh, oh, my little buddy. Hey, little friend. What is it? Come here. Yeah, I know, I got I'm gonna move this bag. Guys, I, my favorite little brown cat in the entire world is making a lot of noise, and we're going to give her attention. Because it's my Friday. Meanwhile, my opponent's just trying to show off the stack. Hi! Oh, God, what a perfect cat. Bro! It's Jules of Fury says, I saw you and Maximilian Dude stream last night. You watch him often? Um, I've watched uh, Maximilian Dude on and off for a long time, especially whenever there's Marvel vs. Capcom streams, um, which is what was happening last night. By the way, I, I, I feel like I looked away and my opponent no longer has a board. And, you know, I love to see it. It's terrific. 
What is, what is the plus on this guy? Exile the top three cards and creature cards can get cast. But yeah, man. Maximilian dude is just A plus out of 10. Well, I guess, I guess this has to be chumped, right? God, I love these, I love these chunky, hasty boys. And then I scribe. <laughs> Pass the blocker phase into the face bonking phase. Isn't this isn't this just terrific? Isn't this just the way you love to see it? Look at Satyrs coming coming in hot. Uh, Lanor Visionary is another one of the new pieces that works very nicely in Jun Sack. Jun Sack likes to have very spiky turns. Extra mana can be quite helpful for that. That's why you see Paradise Druids, um, the Geese, and Landmore Visionary also redraws a card. So you kind of like get these big spikes of multiple pieces coming out. Love to see this sort of thing coming into these new decks. Got him. Let's see. We Pig. We Pig. We Pig says, Yeah, I'm a high schooler. My best friend graduated and is going to school for game design. Me and him have been making games together since kindergarten. We're making a war game and it's going slowly, but it's lots of fun. And of course, no worries about uh, copy pasting that message two or three times, We Pig. I think that's really normal. Especially when I'm like, Please give me an answer. And then you see that I didn't respond to your answer. <laughs> This is actually not a terrific hand. I'm actually going to chuck this one back. Because we, we, we basically have... That's actually better. I mean, I, I've wound up with a slightly similar hand, but... Um, I really don't want to get my worst token generator. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Alright, we lost. We're up against Mono Red, maybe? Soul Scar Mage. There's another key card in Historic y'all gotta know about. Prowess, which means anytime you cast non-creature, it gets plus one, plus one till end of turn. That's good. Big spiky damage. But here's the important one. If a source you control would deal non-combat damage to a creature an opponent controls, put that many minus one, minus one counters on that creature instead. So, for instance, if you want to shock something for two and you don't have any more mana, damage goes away at the end of the turn, unless it's minus one, minus one counters. Is this a wizard? Is this a human wizard? Forbidden friendship. Uh, Ten Ton Hammer says, you're only going to look at the new cards once the whole set is spoiled. Um, I'm probably going to be um, kind of peeking at it on and off. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a little tired because, man, was a lot of work last two days. Put a lot of energy into that. And then I drank soju and listened to music till 2 in the morning last night. So that's another reason that I'm, I'm a little tired. Ooh, maybe I should have swung to guarantee the flip on the Legion's Landing, which guarantees the Transmogrify. One, two, three. I'm going to let it all through. Want to recommend some hot bean water? Yeah, I need, a, I need to brew up some hot bean water. I think I think I made a big mistake here. Hi, sweet pie. Hello, my perfect kitten. Come here. Hey, come here. Oh my God. She. Wow. She's on the run. 
There she goes. Uh, so I know I'm doing this in, oops, this one, yeah, yeah, I'm positive. I have returned. Are we about to get Ramanep ruined? Are we about to get Grim Lava Mansory? No! Mono Red Burn is quite strong. I think this is one of the reasons why I needed to swing the previous turn. I think that that was just like right after I passed it, I could see the air. You know. Cold brew sucks, man. Let's be honest. I'm all about the hot bean water. None of this cold bean water nonsense. Maybe I should write up a little script that detects when my mic is muted, so that way it shows a little muting in the corner. It's the hand. Leg Ion landing. Boom. Phoebeus, it is good to be back. It is good to be back. We got a very, very busy set of days incoming. Very, very, very busy set of days. But I'm hoping that in... Stop there. Let's do one of these. I'm hoping that by, you know, something like um, end of September, I really want to do some sort of interesting, fun, streamy thing outside the ordinary. Truly outside the ordinary. I've done it. Flippe la page. Clever girl. My lord, Eve James. Do it. Do it. Are you ready to see this? Da -dum, da -dum. Goodbye, Dinopal. has been discussed in chat before, but I'd appreciate some advice. I'm curious about getting into game design and don't know where to start. Program in Python at my job, so I'm used to coding. Any suggestions or resources would be much appreciated. All right, let me tell you the answer to this, okay? The answer. Two sets of things for the answer. First one, pick an engine that already exists. You have two choices, Unreal or Unity. That's it. 
I recommend Unity only because I literally use Unity. I have friends that only use Unreal. Many games come out of both of them. There's no wrong choice here. But I'm going to use Unity for the sake of example, right? So first, first pick Unity. And then, as part of them pickings, I would consider just following along with some simple ass tutorial. A simple ass tutorial with the following goal. How the hell does this engine even work? You're just getting used to the boutons. You hate to draw it. You're just trying to get used to the, the mental framework. So follow along with some tutorials, right? So that's your first half. Pick an engine, follow along with tutorials to get yourself familiar. Familiar. Okay. Second thing. Second thing. This one's important. Here's the second one. This is going to be an important one. Here's the, the important second piece. You are probably thinking to yourself that you want to design some cool stuff. You feel like you maybe want to build some dope applications, right? Forget that shit. I gotta shut the door. Ugh. You forget that nonsense. Try on your first, say, six to 12 game projects. Try to figure out something that you can get done with in one to three weeks. One to three weeks. That is your magical number to consider. I think I just outright lose this matchup. I'm going to talk about magic more in a sec, but I just haven't gotten the chance to socialize a lot lately. Yeah, so try to think of a game project you can get done with in one to two, three weeks. Now, why such a short turnaround time? What a hand. Why such a short turnaround time? It's so you can go, I can definitely get this done in one week. And then after three weeks, you realize you're still not even done. Alright, so that's this is this is how you start. You start by first picking an engine, learning how that engine literally works. Start learning that shit. And just by following along, second, you start doing tiny, tiny, tiny game design ideas. And you're noting, but well, I had a really cool idea for an RPG. You don't get to do it. You don't get to do it. I have recently been getting interested in playing basketball. Because uh, one of my friends is a big fan of the WNBA. Um, I was watching some games with her. It was fun, cool, and exciting. I was like, oh, maybe I will play basketball one day. Unlikely, but a little fantasy is existing in my brain. You know what's going to happen when I start playing basketball? I'm not going to be able to dunk. I'm not going to. Fuck that dream. That's a dream for two years from now. I don't want to go in and start dunking right away. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Sit down. So, how do we wish to do this? You know, I, I think... I mean, we're, we're going to lose one. I presume uh, uh, that Villain will not want to do much more than that. Okay, trading's fine. Yeah, like, like the, the, these one to three week projects are for you to get in the habit of thinking not to make the next EVE Online, not to make the next Dragon Age Origins, not to do any of that stuff. It's to get you familiar with the experience of doing these three things, okay? Are you ready? Here's the three things that you're trying to do when you're trying to come up with your game. One, figure out, before you start coding, what are some really cool mechanics, ideas, systems, coming up with that. Second, 
literally make it work. Third, polish that shit up. Don't forget the third one. Uh, do I win? Keep the one that lives. Yeah, and, and because you're doing this in three week cycles, you're just getting used to it. You're just getting used to it. And this can then build you up to the following. Signing up for a game jam. Sign up for a game jam. And then this will give you, again, some more fun to do. And once you've done all that shit, then you are allowed to say, what's an idea that I really care about that I want to try to start to realize. Isn't that interesting? We just spent, in this whole story, this is like two years of doing shit where you're not actually that emotionally attached to any of your designs. What you should be getting emotionally attached to is the process of making shit. Do we lose in this turn? That is the question, Nuskuda. This deck is fun because it's just so linear. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff Hoagland. Unicorn Jam. Unicorn Jam is made when you squeeze a unicorn onto a piece of toast. Mmm. I love waking up with a nice piece of hot toast covered in unicorn jam. Ross is funny. Yes, he is. Hit me. My crusade isn't over yet. My crusade isn't over yet. What's the other one? Mm, opt. Dot by do opt. We did it, everybody. All right, let me let me take a peek at some. I'm going to historic. We're gonna do some of the top decks, baby. All right, so let's just this guy just has haste. All right, it'll do. Yep. Ooh, sign says. In you go. <sighs> oh. Oh. You'd love to see it. You'd love to see it. Hey, savory cookie. Good to see you, man. Savory cookie human being that thought seized our hearts and dreams away we're having a blast with this one man we are we are linear boros blast it up let's see what what, what kind of decks are we in the mood for do we want to play because i feel like burn salt eye sack um are the big ones the big big ones you know what you know what it's been a minute it's been a minute i I'm gonna, I'm gonna play some mono blue. I'm gonna play some mono blue. I want, I want to do, do, do the mono blue, blue, blue. Ten ton hammer. We play the mono black God Pharaoh's gift. I don't even remember what card is God Pharaoh's gift. Oh yeah, um, Azorius Enchantments is really good. You know, weirdly, I almost like decks that are monocolored more than I like decks that are three-colored. 
I almost like that more. <laughs> fuck yeah. Oh, uh, fuck yeah. By the way, we're up against Esper, huh? I mean, this, if we, if we bop the land down. Okay. Counter? The Glacial Fortress is beautiful. You almost like monocolor because it's just like I'm blue. Oh yeah. Boom. <laughs> Do you want to build a snowman? I have the power of the space bar. You might not have the power of the space bar, but I have the power of the space bar. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Did it, did it, did it, did it. Alright, we're gonna we're gonna play this till we lose. Push me and let it touch me until I get my satisfaction. Oh no! It's an ornithopter touche. Okay, so this this is the deck. This is the Azorius Enchantments deck. This is an enchantment. Give a thing plus one, plus one, and first strike. Make a soldier. What does this say? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Cartouche of Solidarity is, like, so, so stupidly good. Yep, and then you start drawing cards on your zero mana Ornithopter. Because, like, if you're mono blue and you need to, like, you have counter spells, but then the only way to deal with stuff is to, like, freeze, tap, bounce. Like, I, I like when things start to become more and more circuitous and roundabout. <laughs> yeah, ouch. Draw away, my friend. Please draw. Do you see why this deck is good? And then in order to sort of deal with other sets of problems, like what if we're against an aggro deck and we're running low on life, you can get like life gain enchantments and plop it on a thing. And yada, yada, yada. God, I love Legion's Lane. This card's rad. Like there's a trend in big multimedia franchise these days with WotC integrating their different games right developing stuff across the board in their universe etc it's interesting to see where this is going to go I, I have some opinions on oh it's not the card that I want to play I was trying to play this one but you know what can you do um the whole notion of transmedia franchises and make uh you know these crazy multimedia franchises um this topic has been explored a lot by an academic named Henry Jenkins. He wrote a great book called Convergence Culture. Uh, I guess it's a pretty old book by now. It's like maybe 10 years old. Just about how, how compelling a media experience can be when it's not 
fragmented, but it is instead additive. So for instance, um, let's say I did a story where chapter one was a written chapter, and then chapter two was a webisode, and chapter three was an interactive thing. This feels very fragmented, right? You're going in all sorts of different directions to... I quit, I'm going to play real dumb. You're going in all sorts of different directions and it can feel hard to kind of like get the experience, but there's the idea of additive transmedia storytelling, which might be that I watched Avatar The Last Airbender, the series, right? And that is one fell swoop of like, or one entire set of content. But then maybe I could get a booklet that explains the various fighting styles. And it's just about that. Right, so all of a sudden it starts to be an additive thing, right? Where like now it is enriching my experience of the other thing, as opposed to I had to stop watching Avatar, read the book, and then go back to this. And I think that there is there is a good thing and a bad thing that I see to the. I'll play one more game because this deck is so brainless that I can I can talk and play at the same time. There's another, uh, like, this trend of the huge multimedia-ifying of things. And actually, let's talk about what is meant by that. It's the idea of, say, hey, we're Riot, and we started with one game. It's called League of Legends, and it is 95% Dota 1. And I, by the way, I don't say that as some sort of knock. I mean, obviously, the game is brilliant and functions quite, quite differently than Dota in terms of gameplay. But, it, you know, upon its inception, 95% Dota. You have characters that are put in there, random lore. Essentially, all the good ideas, all the bad ideas, all the random ideas, they all made it into the League of Legends lore right at the very beginning. But then the success builds, the art style gets more refined. They did that full art repass work, and they started to really bring out the identity and the characters and rework the lore. And now they have this thing. Isn't that great? They did all that work. Let's leverage that. Rune Terra, it's a card game, but it leverages all the art style and characters and all this stuff. And if I'm thinking about this from a product perspective, I go, hey, really good. We did one core set of art and world building, and we're tuning it for the card game as opposed to reinventing it for the card game. Um, and, and I think that this is really cool because when I look at, you know, Henry Jenkins was actually a professor of mine at USC, and he's super rad dude. Um, rad, bad, rad. Super rad dude. And talked a lot about the, these kinds of concepts and why they can be really exciting, and I mean, I just, I feel like it's literally true. Like, um, the, this is, I uh, instantly true. Covert Ops? Or not Covert Ops. Um, was it Covert Ops? The Nova missions, whatever the hell they were. They were not actually really your usual StarCraft RTS style missions. But it was fun, it was like a fun additive experience for me. I really loved it. And I can I can see in so many ways. I can see in so many ways. League of Legends with their IP spreading to all these other games to make it feel more rich and awesome. Comic books did a lot of this all throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, started to like intermingle tons of different characters from different storylines and build universes. It made it really rich. A character would show up in this one book and then go away, and then if I had a curiosity, huh, I wonder what, what more I could learn about that character. And then you know what you do? You dig in, and you discover there's so fucking much more to learn about that character. It's so cool. Am I just going straight into a lofty design? What is, what is this? Look out, disperse. I'm gonna play real bad. Alright, this was fun while it lasted. But, um... And so, I, I, I think that in a lot of ways... I don't want to call this a free win, but there's like a really good product logic to it, right? You've got your first product logic of... It's less work literally less work you know what the entire marvel cinematic universe you know what's really cool they have like decades of understanding of all these characters and they can see what worked and hasn't worked without needing to guess ter if ek ye ha second thing um in addition to it being like eliminating work um something people want they want more information they want to dig deeper into things all right cool terrific 
Um, one of the worries that I have, though, one of the worries that I have, and this is something I've talked about before, what I'm about to say is not at odds with any of the awesomeness that exists with spreading your franchise out into more more mediums. Right? But here's my concern. My concern is when businesses are looking to make certain financial decisions, one that I think leads to a lot of false analysis and false opportunity costs and just false decision-making processes is the, well, we don't want to do anything that is too creatively risky, where risky is ill-defined. We want to do something that we know is safe. So for instance, Hollywood, I think it was that like in the 90s, if you looked at like the top 10 grossing movies each year, they were all sort of original works, and nowadays they're all sequels. Or remakes, or things like this. Rarely does like something new and fresh just boom, pop on up. And the point that I'm not trying to make is that if you try to multimedia a five thing, that that means you're being fundamentally non-creative and not making something good. That's not the point I'm making. I'm not making that point. But it is the concern I have where you can kind of get into this situation where you convince yourself you should never come up with something new. Well, not ever, but now nah, let's not come up with something new. How do we just like build upon an existing franchise? Hey, you know what? You want to make a really cool monster movie? We have the Alien IP. Why don't you just make it Alien? Why don't you just make it Predator? I mean, they have built-in audiences. You know, I think that... Just because the tool is there and the tool can do good things doesn't mean that you need to use that tool always. It is, I mean, Riot has really great characters and lore with all their stuff, but if they're making a product, it does not mean that they need to use the League of Legends IP. They don't need to do it. Like, Valorant didn't use it, and no one went, well, that's weird that Valorant isn't using League characters. They should have used League characters. I, don't, I didn't see anybody say that. All right. And so my hope is that people do wind up taking these really interesting, rich worlds. Like for me, that's Avatar The Last Airbender. Give me more Avatar. I don't care. I like as many comics as you print, as many series as you come up with. I'll watch them. Except for that M. Night Shyamalan movie. I'm not that curious. <laughs> I want more of that. And I hope that these things get expanded. But at the same time, I hope that it is not done instead of cool creative new ideas i hope it's done in addition to them did i do it did i make my point i think i made a point feels good to make a point feels good to make a point no one's typing anything right now which either means that i was so clear in my elucidations or that my audience has fallen apart 